Greetings from Barkster Guitar Amplifier Repairs. Stuart Smith as always in the workshop and on the trolley today I've got a Fender Pro Reverb. I think this might be a reissue but I'm not quite, quite sure. I'll have a look in a moment. Basically crackling, popping, spitting and making all sorts of horrible noises. Let's just have a quick listen to it so that you can see. The problem seems to be mostly on the vibrato channel, although I can hear it in the background there. If I turn up the non-vibrato channel, it's just a little bit crackly there. Yeah, I haven't heard that before. On the vibrato channel. We've got this, we've got this more low frequency rumbling hissing. It's also humming a bit more than I'd expect it to hum. Yeah, that's performing quite nicely for us, I think you'll agree. Also, the controls are quite dirty. It's certainly crackling and spitting. Now, I know what you're thinking. Valves. But you'd be wrong in this instance because I have already gone through and swapped out all the preamp valves. So it's not a valve related problem, it's going to be some sort of resistor or capacitor. So I think we're going to have to take the chassis out of this one, get it up on the bench and uh, see if we can track this fault down. Okay, here we are on the inside of the amp. Um, I can see I've worked on this amp before. I just recognise the way that I replace these 25 microfarads at 25 volts cathode bypass capacitors. I think I vaguely remember putting those two in as well. That's a bit of a horrible old lump, isn't it? Um, lots of old carbon resistors on here. That's quite likely to be a source of noise and uh, the usual wavy tag board there you get that with these amps don't know why that happens but it does nothing much you can do about that um so yeah bit of a bias mod there gonna... yes i've done some work on this amp but not everything i can see this looks like the bias capacitor there. I think I'll change that. Look, looks quite old. Uh, screen resistors are fairly good. All in all, kind of what you'd expect for this age of amps. Had a bit of work done, but not everything. So I think what we're going to have to do with this is uh, power it up and I might have to go straight for an oscilloscope on this one and try and track down where this noise is coming in. Well the first thing as always is to check that we still have the fault with the amp up on the bench and we do. You can hear that rumbling away there. Oh yes, that's quite bad, isn't it? But I think what we'll do is we'll pull the first three preamp valves out and uh, see if see if any of this stops. There's one. There's two. Now it's gone down considerably with preamp valve 2 being pulled out. I can still hear it high frequency chuntering away there. But that has removed a lot of the noise, interesting. Let's put that one back. There we go, that's back in. It's just warming up. There you go. Okay, well, a lot of that low frequency noise is coming from that valve area. 
Okay, we have changed it, but I'm just going to change it again just to be absolutely sure. I've put the valve from V1 into V2 and it's still exactly the same. So it's not valve related. It's something to do with uh, what this valve is doing. I've put some freezer spray on these 100k resistors here. And it's just thawing out now, you can hear it. And um, it is making quite a racket. So it may be those 100k resistors. I don't like the looks of uh, this one here. It's got a little bit of kind of leakage out the end. So it might be as simple as that. Uh, here's a little trick you can do. Obviously be careful, but you can actually short circuit pin um, 1 and pin 6 which are the anodes of the preamp valves going via these 100k resistors you can actually short those to ground thereby killing the signal and hearing, listening whether that signal cures the, the fault. So if I, if I short circuit this I can still hear it rumbling away a bit. This one that's largely gone so we can tell it's on this side of the of the um, of the valve. <clears throat> so that's spitting away now, and then that's killed it. Well, a likely candidate is always these 100k resistors, so I think I'm just going to, on spec, swap out all these 300k resistors here. They're old carbon ones, and that noise I'm hearing is very typically a carbon resistor noise. Um, the other thing that's quite a useful thing to do is to heat it up with a heat gun. So uh, let's just do that just for the fun of it. So here we are, just put a bit of heat on these. That's interesting, the second I did that, that noise completely disappeared. Bit of freezer spray. Interesting. It's gone completely, the noise. Oh, ooh. Oh, oh, there it goes, come back, and gone, the second I do that with a heater, heat gun, so my money is on probably that resistor there, but I'm going to change every single one of those, so I'm going to turn the amp off and uh, discharge it, and then we'll, we'll swap those resistors out. Okay, I thought whilst I was at it I'd replace all of these 100k resistors. So I've done those two, those two, those two, that one and that one. Uh, moment of truth, I'll turn it on. I haven't turned it on yet. Uh, here's the mains. Just letting it all warm up. I can still hear something. Yeah, I can still hear it. How annoying. Not as bad, a lot better in fact, just that occasional little crumble there, that's annoying. Oh, there we go, no. So that hasn't fixed that, how annoying. goes down a lot again if I short circuit the anode of this part of V2. Okay, that's interesting. I'm shorting the um, control grid now on that valve. 
and that also kills it. So that tells me it's coming in into this valve from up here somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna need to get a bit more technical with this. Okay, now uh, the grid goes up to the volume control here. So if I short the volume control to ground, that kills it. The volume control is fed from the treble control, so if I short that to ground, that kills it. And, uh, and the treble control is fed from here. That kills it. Now where's that come from? Okay, uh, we've got a very nasty fault here actually. I've spent about a couple of hours on it since I last spoke to you. Still haven't uh, tracked it down yet. At the moment it's behaving itself but it'll gradually start to grumble. And if I put the heat gun on it anywhere in this area here, even for a couple of seconds, it, it stops it dead and then it comes back. Now that to me is almost always a dodgy component. Well we've changed these two and I've um, used a little trick by putting the soldering iron. You can put the soldering iron close to a component. For example this little capacitor here is a good candidate and uh, you can heat it up individually and if a little squirt of the heat gun makes it go then certainly bringing this uh, soldering iron up to it would certainly cause it to uh, fix the problem too and I haven't been able to narrow it down to either this resistor here, this capacitor, this capacitor, or this capacitor. I think that's been changed actually. However, I don't like this curving board and I'm just wondering if it's something... It's kicking off again now. I'm just wondering if it's something to do with the fact that heating up the this area causes the board to flex a little bit. So now watch, watch this. Well, there you go. I'm able to just I'm, I'm slightly pressing on the board there. So I think this is probably some feature of this board bowing. That makes life very awkward, actually. See, that's that's giving exactly the same symptom. That so it's certainly not a faulty component. I'm just bouncing up and down on the board here very lightly, actually. Could be anywhere. Nasty. Now I can go over all these joints, but they all look fairly good to me. I think it'd be nice to narrow it down a bit. So I can stop that just by pressing on the board there. Hear that? Lifting the board. Nasty, nasty problem this. Right, well I suppose I can just go over a load of joints and see if we get lucky. I'm never really sure what goes on underneath these boards actually. Are there, are there links of wire going across underneath? I've never seen on, on the underside of one of these, for obvious reasons really. You never take them out. To take this board out, of course, is, is, a, is a kind of living nightmare. Look at all these connections here. All of these have to come off and all these, you know, you're probably, you're probably better off taking off all the connections on this side then trying to turn it up. Very nasty. It's really kicking off there, isn't it? I mean, we can, yeah, see that's cured it just by undoing that screw look. And then when I do it up, it comes back. <laughs> oh, there you go, we'll just leave the screw undone. Nasty, 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 this. So anyway, we've, we've got somewhere. It's not valves and it's not a component. So that's good. Some sort of dry joint but we can't get a handle on the dry joint because none of these wires here individually cause it to kick off. It's 
sensitive all over here, so it's somewhere in this entire area here. Not very helpful, is it? Okay, well, okay, I've been over all the joints in this area. I'm not hopeful, to be honest with you, but uh, let's give it a go. Okay, I can hear it working. We'll need to leave it a moment or so to see if that comes back. Sounding fairly quiet at the moment, but when I turned it on last time it took five minutes to uh, to come good to just to start grumbling away I think I'll just leave that on for five minutes and then I'll rejoin you strangely enough it's actually promising so far that has ooh that's interesting I'm pressing the board there's nothing there well 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 might get lucky there let's leave it on yeah I'm pressing the board and there's no grumbling wow no one's going to be more surprised than me just going over all of these joints and uh, and curing that. Let's see if we get lucky. Well, good news, my friends. Um, nobody is more surprised than me, but it's been on half an hour now, and there is no grumbling. A bit hummy. I'm going to have a little look at that, but. Uh, all that grumbling has gone away. So it was a dry joint. There were no obvious dry joints when I went over them. This is solid now. And uh, I just did every single joint from here to here. And that seemed to cure it. Great. Whew. Well, well, well. I mean, you could go on and on with this, uh, with this amp. Don't like these very much. I think I'd like to change that and that one maybe and that one the other thing I'm going to do is to just check the bias and um, yeah okay well I'll uh, and I need to service the pots as well so I'll, I'll do the pots while I think about it and um, do a bit of measurement on these few resistors and see what sort of tolerance they're in but we've solved the main problem which is great just a quick aside, it certainly has not hurt to change all these old carbon resistors for these much more modern resistors here. So that's a good job done anyway, I didn't waste anything doing that. It's interesting isn't it, we didn't, we didn't get lucky changing that with a dry joint because look, we, there are um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11, there's 11 joints that we did in this area just by putting those resistors in and uh, and uh, the dry joint wasn't one of them. So uh, had I, that was a, that's actually it's quite interesting that, had I had um, that been one of the dry joints we would never have known and I would have said to you, yep, this 100k resistors, they often go noisy, which they do by the way. So we would never have known it was a dry joint, we would have, we would have uh, given ourselves a pat on the back for changing a 100k resistor. Well, just before I flip it over to check the bias, I've changed the capacitor which smooths the negative bias voltage there. I put 100 microfarads, 100 volts in there, and in there was a 10 microfarad, 63 volt capacitor, which had 77 volts across it when I measured it. So how that hasn't failed, I don't know. And that's also way too small, so I don't know where that came from not original to the amp so someone's changed that at some point um yeah anyway there you go i've upgraded that capacitor too so let's now flip this over and see what the bias is doing right we're set up here with a bias meter on one of the valves i'll take it out of standby and uh oh that's uh, pretty high that's 60 milliamps that's too high Little screwdriver in there. See if we can get that down a bit. Still crumbling away a bit this amp. Not as bad as it was, but it seems to settle down after a while. Um, right, that's more like it. 400 volts and 37 milliamps. That's okay. 
I am going to swap the meter onto this valve as well and make sure that's giving about the same sort of reading. So let's do that next. Right, two bias meters now. And uh, out of standby. So we've got 35 on that one and very hard to read this meter, 33 on this one. So that's okay. Good. Right, now uh, those caps will have been done. I think I did those last time. Oh, I noticed we've still got a preamp valve out, out of the front end here. That's from when I was uh, checking. So let's pop that back in. There we go. It's still a very slight grumbling. I can hardly hear it now, but but that horrible noise has gone. Bit of hum there, which I would like to get rid of, but I don't really know how. Um, well, I thought I'd take the uh, take the lid off here and have a look at what's going on here. Now, these caps have been changed, but not by me. They've been changed some years ago. They're RS caps. I never use RS caps. There's a slight bulge in this one here. I don't know if you can see, just there. They look okay along here, but these are now quite old, these caps. What I've got here is I've got my, a little tool that I made here, which has a 100 microfarad 450 volt capacitor just across these two leads. So I can, I can uh, just dab an extra capacitor across here, this will spark a bit. There you go. When I do that, I don't know if you can hear, so that's with the capacitor on, that's with it off. Considerable amount of extra hum. Faster on, off. I can now discharge that internal capacitor by pressing that button. So let's just try a couple of the other caps. So we'll just go on to here now. I think if I changed all these caps, that hum would be greatly reduced. No difference there. So that cap hasn't made any difference. Um, I'm putting 100 microfarads across here. This is probably typically, I don't know, it might be 22 or something, that one. So so the hum's coming in on the HT line, basically. Let's try this one. A little bit. Just a tiny bit there. These big ones here also, they respond to treatment as well. So if I go on to here, and then on to here, a little bit, you won't be able to hear that. And then try the other one. No, not very much there. So I think beefing up this one would reduce the hum. That seems to be the best option. That halves it roughly. Okay. Mm kind of money decision this really. It's not cheap to replace all these caps. Um, I think I might ask the customer what he fancies doing. You can go on and on spending money on these amps. Um, I'd like to spend another couple of hundred quid on this and uh, you know, change some of those caps on the tag board there. But it all depends really on what the customer wants to spend. I thought I'd just briefly explain what I did there when I was short-circuiting out those preamp valves. It's quite a useful thing. So um, here's the valve. Here's the heater here, which I haven't shown connected. Here's the cathode, which normally goes to ground. And here's the control grid into which you put your little signal. 
and typically here's the plate and that normally goes via typically a 100k resistor up to HT which in this case is 350 volts so little signal here big current goes up and down here big voltage ends up out here so what I did was effectively to connect this point here down to ground via a crock clip to crock clip short circuiting that valve. Now you can see that would immediately kill any signal there so it's a good way of finding out if the um, noise is coming in on this stage or whether it's a bit further down the train. So for example if I short circuited that and I can still hear uh, the crackling noise coming out the amplifier then there's nothing to do with this valve it's further down that way. So that's, that's, the, that's the actual idea. Now you have to be, you might think, well can you just short circuit a valve like that? Well yes you can, you have to be a little bit careful um, because all you're doing is taking that 100k resistor down to ground so you've got 350 volts there, 100k straight down to ground. Okay well that's that's okay but you just have to make sure you're not pulling too much current so let me show you how much current and power that resistor dissipates when you short circuit it like that. Well let's do the sums the power through a resistor is given by V squared over R where V is the voltage across the resistor and R is the resistance. The voltage across this resistor in this short circuited condition is 350 volts because 350 volts there, ground there, was 350 volts. So our V squared is uh, 350 times 350 which is 122,500. So V squared is 122,500 divided by R which is 100k or 100,000 100, 123. 100, so we can go 1, 1 and that takes the decimal point to there that takes a decimal point to there and that takes a decimal point to there so we've got 1.2 watts going through that resist uh, sorry 1.2 watts being dissipated by that resistor and uh, that's kind of okay but you know these resistors aren't very highly rated it's probably 2 watts at the most so you don't want to be short circuiting that for a long time it's just really dab on uh, there's no signal there or dab on yep yeah, that kills it I've got a few seconds of 1.2 watts through that resistor is perfectly okay. So I just thought you'd be interested in that little technique there. I don't use it very often, but uh, it's quite a useful one sometimes when you're going through stage by stage by stage to try and locate some noise. I've had a chat with a customer and um, he said money is no object and uh, just do, what you, do whatever you need to do to the amp to get it up to scratch. So I'm going to do that, take him at his word. It shouldn't cost a fortune, but one of the very first things I want to do is to replace these electrolytic capacitors because they are, at least one of them is leaking. And we saw earlier that when we put a, another capacitor across them, the hub went down quite significantly. So I think changing these will actually reduce the hum. And they need doing anyway, because at some point they are going to fail. They're quite old, these radio spares. Capacitors. If I had to guess, I'd say, I don't know, 25 years old would be my best guess on that. Before I do anything, I'm just going to check their discharge. It's actually been uh, three or four days since I last did anything on this amp. But <laughs> you can never tell with these things. Uh, there's absolutely nothing on there at all. Which is what I'd expect, but there you go. Right, so we're going to pop in some new capacitors there. I've done this several times on several videos so I'm not going to kind of bore you too much with the detail of changing these capacitors I'll whisk through that and then I'm going to turn the amp upside down we're going to look underneath and see what else we would ideally like to do to uh, improve this amplifier now let me show you what I'm going to do here these are 100 microfarads at 450 volts I'm going to replace those with 200 microfarads at 350 volts. And you might think, oh, uh, that doesn't sound good. However, these two caps are in series. And um, between them, they've only got half of the voltage, the HT voltage across them. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that the negative of this capacitor is here going to the positive of this capacitor. So these are, and they're just joined together there, look. So the voltage comes in here, it goes through this cap, through this cap, and out here. So 
350 volt capacitor gives you a 700 volt capability, which is well above what these take. I did actually measure the voltage across here, and it was about 210 volts or something, so these are well within spec, so that's no problem at all. Um, we'll check these two 220k resistors here. There's, a, there's one across each of the capacitors, and they're there just to even out the voltage across the capacitors, so that each one's got half of the voltage across it. Now, on these ones here, these are 22 microfarads at um, 450 volts. I'm going to upgrade those to 47 microfarads at 500 volts. I just happen to have some 500 volt caps. 450 is plenty for this application. So that'll give a bit more smoothing here. We'll replace all those three there with 47 microfarads and these with 100 microfarads like that. So that's the plan. So let's get to it. I've made a quick sketch of the caps. I just thought I'd let you know this because even with all my experience and hundreds of amps, thousands of amps under my belt, it's still quite easy to uh, just gaily start taking these out and putting them all in and getting it, getting it wrong. So I've marked the polarity of these caps here. And the interesting thing is that you know these negative, 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 negative is very tempting to put the negative of this one here too, but this one needs reversing, and that's because it's in series with this one. So we have effectively, here's the situation, one capacitor there, one capacitor there going to ground. So that's HT there, here's that capacitor, and here's that capacitor, plus, minus, plus, minus, going to ground. And our two resistors go across, our two 220K resistors go across like this. balancing out the voltage so that you've got half of the voltage across this cap and half of the voltage across that cap. So, for example, if this was 500 volts, you'd have 250 volts across there, 250 volts across there. That's why these 350 volt caps are well within the uh, tolerance of what we're doing here. Right, that's the caps snipped out. We're just going to chuck those in the bin. We're not going to do anything with them. I just want to check these, these two 220K resistors. The reason for checking them is if they are different from each other, the voltage won't be equal across the caps, it'll be different. These are carbon resistors, they always go high, so I'd expect these to read 230k or something. Let's have a look. Mm, that's exactly 220k, that's good. And this one... Ah, I see that one's high. <coughs> Two... Let's get on. Two... Two hundred and... 45k or 244k versus 220k. So that means that the voltage across these capacitors will be in the ratio of 245 to 220. There will be, let me think about this, so more voltage across this one than that one. So, although it doesn't matter, one's got 270 volts on, one's got 261 volts across, let's get it right and, and we'll change those two resistors, I think. Whilst we're here, why don't we measure these two as well? Because we may get into a situation of changing all the all of these resistors. So, what's this 10k is? Ten point five k. That's okay. This two k two is two k four. Do you know what? Right, let's just change them all. These are old carbon. These are all originals, of course. These are all old carbon resistors. That's 10% over its value. And this one is 5% um, over, 6% over. So, yeah, let's just change them. And there are our resistors ready to put in. I've got two nice uh, 220K resistors, a 2K2 and a 10K. There we go, that's the resistors in. One, two, three, four. So now I'm going to put these capacitors in with a blob of hot melt glue on the board.
Okay, so that's the HT caps changed. I double checked they're in the right way around. So all we will do now is to plug it in and check that these voltages are all sensible. Um, So let's see what we've got here. Um, 350 across there, which is good. 420, 450. Yeah, these are 500 volt caps. They were 450 volts in before. So that's not terribly good. 450 volt cap there look and it's got 444 across it so that's not good that 500 volt caps much better we are getting 226 across one 217 across the other so i'm happy with that there's a slight mismatch but it doesn't matter don't forget these voltages are well below the working voltages of these capacitors 350 350 it would be a different matter if we had one at 375 and one at 340 or something because we'd be stressing the capacitor but they are well below the working voltages of the capacitor right so now we can put the lid back on and turn it the amp over and start work on the underside right now we need to decide what else we're going to do here on this amp um, by the way I don't know if you've noticed this brown residue all over this amp what's happened here is at some point the main transformer has gone and it's spewed out all of its innards all over here and that's what this is here look it would come off but it would take a lot of doing I don't propose we try and clean that up I don't like these great big brown blobs here so I'm, there's one here there's one here and there's one here oh and there's one down there as well I'm going to test each one of them on the mega again just to see if it has any leakage if it hasn't we'll leave well enough alone and if they have we'll change them uh, looks like I've been in there and changed these two caps these are the grid the caps that feed the grids of the power tubes if they go leaky you get a positive DC voltage on the grid of the power tube and that causes the tubes to go so it looks like I've, I've changed those as a precaution last time I was in here but I didn't do the rest of these. Um, then I might go through some resistor values and just check that they're reasonably okay. We've already done some, as you know. I'll just check a few more. And then I think, oh, the other thing I want to do is tidy up this mess here. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. This is the BIOS pot. It takes the negative BIOS voltage in, pots it down and feeds it off to, um, to the grids of the power valves. This has been tacked across, I think, as a bias adjustment, and that's a bit messy. I'd like to tidy that up. And these caps shouldn't be here, these two smoothing caps. The, it's already smoothed back here, but if you remember, that was like a 10 microfarad cap in there or something, and I've put 100 in there, so I think we can just safely remove those two caps. 
That's about it really. I'd like to try and do something about this waviness of the board, but I don't really know what I can do, short of you know, completely stripping it down. I don't know really. Rebuild it from scratch maybe. Probably, probably just best left. So let's take out one of these caps here. I think the truth is that if we do a couple of them and they're not leaky, we can probably assume none of them are because if they're going to go, they would have gone by now. There we go. God, it really does look horrible. This is a great big brown lump. Yuck. And then I'll get the Mega back out again and we'll see what that's doing leakage-wise. Okay, we've got the Mega connected across this cap, so we just need to press the magic button and that's infinity. So there's no leakage whatsoever on that cap. There's nothing like putting 500 volts across a cap to see if it's going to uh, fall over on you. So that's good, although it's a hideous horrible brown blob. It's a hideous horrible brown blob that seems to be working, so... I think we may as well... Leave that one. We'll do another one, and if that's okay, I think we can assume the other two are, just because they're all the same age, and they're going to start leaking, or they're not going to start leaking. So let's uh, pop this one back in. There we go. Okay, let's see what it's doing. Again, infinite resistance. No leakage whatsoever on that cap. That's perfect. So, they're horrible, but they're all right. Right. So, I guess we could check a few resistor values. Um, I won't use the auto ranging one this time, all that beeping gets on my nerves a bit. So let's just go along a few of these. Well, we've got 47k. Forty nine, that's okay. Fifty, that's okay. Let's see what they're doing. Hundred ninety eight K that's okay. 102k, fine. Yeah, do you know what I think? Without spending tons of the customer's money, let's, uh, let's just tidy this up and call it a day, I think. So these two caps shouldn't be here. They've been tacked across to smooth the negative DC bias voltage because that cap there was the wrong value. It was, um, remember, it was that yellow thing we took out. My old mess this is actually. Now what's been going on here? Then we'll turn it on and uh, see what it's doing. See if that hum's gone down a little bit. Right, let's put this 33k resistor in a. It doesn't matter, but let's put it in a bit nicer than that. Well, I think it's probably time to turn it on again since we haven't turned it on for a while.
Okay, we're in and plugged on, plugged in and switched on, and the hum is uh, significantly less actually. So that's very good. Those caps have made a difference to the hum. I say it's gone down to about 25% of what it was. That's all okay. Vibrato channel. moment the vibrato is not on. I think we have to put the shorting link in for that. There we go. Lovely. That's great. Now I'm just going to quickly check the bias again because we've removed these caps here, tidied up the bias side and uh, we may have a bit more HT voltage after changing the um, HT caps. So I think it's just worth our while quickly revisiting the bias, although I don't expect it to have changed very much. Four fifty volts, four forty bias, thirty four, thirty three milliamps. That's probably okay. Good. Nothing's changed there. Happy with that. So we can put this little baby back together and call it a day. And I quoted the customer quite a lot for doing that extra work, but actually it won't come up to anything like that amount because I thought I was going to do a lot more work. So he'll be fairly pleased with that. And this is good to go. We'll put the covers back on onto these and uh, put it back in its chassis and call that job done. Well there you go another one under the belt another Fender Pro Reverb. I like working on these old Fenders they're, uh, they're great amps and there are a lot of them around and they'll limp on for many many years giving good service. So we didn't kind of do more than we had to on this amp and I think that's a good policy. We just did the fault that was there, that horrible crackling roaring sound, changed the HT caps, did a few resistors, checked a few other caps and then just left well alone. I don't really like blanket changing all the caps for modern ones and changing all the resistors for modern ones. Um, the amp would work probably better but we want to, to leave as much originality as we can. That's my theory anyway. Okay, that's it for me. I'll catch you next time. Thanks as always for watching.